Hello. Yay. Woo. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jen Helsby. Oh, she just fixed the slides. It's okay. <laughs> Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jen and I'm going to give you a brief update on the Secured Rock project. So for those of you that don't know, one of the last projects that Aaron worked on was a whistleblower submission system. And he worked on this with Kevin Paulson and the late James Dolan. And the idea was that this would be a system that could be used by any news organization that would provide strong security protections for sources. And the motivation for a project like that comes from the current surveillance landscape. If an investigator wants to learn the identity of a source, it used to be that they could go to a journalist and ask them and the journalist would rightly refuse. But today an investigator doesn't need to ask a journalist who is your source as they can go to a third party like Verizon or Gmail or AT&T that has the records of who talked to who and they can figure out a source's identity that way and prosecute them. This is not a theoretical threat. We've seen a massive increase in the investigation and prosecution of journalistic sources under both Obama and Trump. And in many of these cases, metadata is used to identify whistleblowers and then is used as evidence in their prosecution. Uh, for example, Jeffrey Sterling, who is charged with revealing details of an operation to supply flawed nuclear weapons designs to Iran, to journalist uh, James Risen, he was identified using metadata and was then charged and convicted with espionage based on email mail and phone metadata and he went to prison. And so that's the problem that Secured Rop is trying to address. Put very well in this uh, Tau Center report on the project that came out a few years ago, Secured Rop restores the effectiveness of a reporter's privilege to protect their sources through principled non-cooperation. How do we do that? Uh, we do that by removing these third parties that collect data about who is talking to who. So news organizations install secure drop on premises at the news organization and all traffic is routed through Tor, which is an anonymity system. And that's done to reduce the metadata trail that links journalists and sources. And that's the trail that leak investigators are following when they attempt to identify an anonymous source. So when you use secure drop from the perspective of a source, you uh, just download Tor browser, which is is an anonymous web browser based on Firefox, and you go to the secure drop site that's associated with an individual news organization. So here I'm showing the Al Jazeera uh, secure drop submission page, and you either click get started to submit something, or you can log in if you have an ongoing correspondence with the journalist at that org. So it's very simple from the source's perspective. These are some of the organizations that uh, are using Secure Drop as of last year. So it includes uh, big news orgs like the New York Times and the Washington Post, as well as uh, smaller nonprofits like Lucy Parsons Labs. In the past year, we've had these new organizations start using Secure Drop. So it includes uh, orgs like uh, NBC News, which is really cool. And the first academic institution that's using Secure Drop to collect data, which is Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science. This is the current team of people, I think some of whom are in the room over there, uh, who are working on Secured Rob, and they're all contractors or employees of Freedom of the Press Foundation, which supports the project. Uh, some of these people are engineers, uh, we also have a support team that helps people install it and get set up, and we have an excellent training team that's led by Harlow Holmes, who teaches journalists how to use both Secured Rob and other digital security tools for journalism. So now I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail about a few of the things that we've done in the past year that people might be interested in. Uh, so this has been our release schedule for mainline development. We release every six to eight weeks. Some of the high points in the past year are that Secure Drop is now available in 20 languages. Most recently, we added Slovak and Czech. So if you speak a natural language that is not represented here, uh, feel free to check out securedrop.org slash translate and complete the translation and we can add it. In the past year, we also added support for next generation onion services, also called B3 onion services. Uh, these are now used by default for news organizations. This is a really major security improvement. We use Tor onion services in a bunch of places in the secure drop ecosystem, even by default for administrators that are working on the instance. Uh, but this improvement is most important uh, for the connection between the source and the server where they're submitting documents. And so by using these new uh, onion services, they're protected by much stronger cryptography. And you can tell if you're a potential source whether this is being used by this 56 character to URL. 
Another area that we've been working on is simplifying the architecture primarily for journalists. So from the perspective of sources, we've made it really easy, uh, you know, just using that web app at the beginning that I showed you, but we've not done as much work making it easy for journalists to check these documents and work with them. And so this work that I'm about to talk about has been funded by Mozilla Foundation, which is much appreciated. So this is basically what the architecture looks like right now. A source submits documents over Tor to a server. Um, a journalist will then download those documents and take them across an air gap. So that means they're going to physically burn those documents onto a CD or they're going to put them on a USB drive and physically take them to an entirely different computer that is air gapped. That is, it's never been connected to a network. And that's what this bold section is at the bottom. And so the reason why it's set up like this is because of the threat of malware. So a journalist can be sent anything from anyone. It could be fake. It could be malicious. If so, we want to ensure that any malicious software from a submission, uh, if it makes its way onto this air gap viewing station, doesn't get off. It can't exfiltrate any of the other sensitive information that is stored in that environment, other sources data, the private key that's used to decrypt those submissions. And that's why we have this uh, air gap to provide security by compartmentalization. The challenge for the journalist is that every time they want to read something, they've got to go through this whole process. They've got to burn a CD or they've got to put this document on a USB drive and take it to a separate machine. And so the motivation for this is can we do something better? And so there's a really promising operating system that I mentioned last time uh, called Cubes OS, uh, where everything is running inside of different virtual machines. So if you want to open sketchy files in one virtual machine without compromising the virtual machine where you keep your, all your passwords, you can do that. And so that's an alternative approach to this physical compartmentalization. So instead of that, we get rid of this whole area and make it much simpler from the perspective of journalists. And so last year at Emmons Swartz Day, we talked a little bit about how we had prototyped this and we were showing people uh, downstairs at the hackathon. Uh, so instead of using the USB song and dance, they use a sing single integrated application that as of yesterday looks like this. So it looks a lot like Slack. Uh, I think last year during this talk, we showed mockups, but this is the built version coded. Um, and we worked on this very application during Hackathon. Uh, so when you download and open a message, it'll open, but it will open in a VM that's only used once for that one document, and then it's destroyed when the VM closes. So since uh, in the past year, we also had a security audit of this whole uh, approach performed, and the idea was to validate the approach, both the architectural standpoint and our implementation, and that was funded by Open Technology Fund, and the work was done by Include Security, and the story has some good news. We're really happy to find that uh, the auditors were not able to find any critical high or even medium risk findings uh, for this approach. So if you're interested in this, uh, I encourage you to check out our repairs on GitHub. We've had some people playing with some of this today. Um, and we're currently in the early stages of preparing a pilot with a few news organizations who will be using this in production with their real SecureDrop instances. And so for those orgs that get a lot of traffic through SecureDrop, especially in the run-up to the election next year when time is of the essence, it can really save people a lot of time and make it a lot simpler and more intuitive for them to do their important work at the end of the day, while still providing really strong security against the very real threat of malware. So. Before I end, I want to tell you about a couple more interesting developments that we've seen in the past year. So this is kind of a fun one. Uh, so in September, we got an inside view of journalists' work cultivating sources, thanks to Eric Trump here, who is the son of Donald Trump, who I'm told is the US president. Uh, he wanted to helpfully note to the owner of the Washington Post the great work that journalists are doing, reaching out to potential sources in the Trump organization in this case. The journalist who is doing this reaching out is David Frownhold, who's best known for his uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporting on Trump during the last presidential election. And in notes that he's sending to sources, he's putting a link to SecureDrop just in case they want to send something. So that was pretty cool. At DEF CON this year, it was announced that the feds are planning to use SecureDrop as a vulnerability reporting platform. And so this is an initiative of the Department of Homeland Security. And the idea being, if hackers want to submit a vulnerability and be protected in the scenario that the government then turns around and tries to prosecute them, imagine that, uh, they would be protected by submitting through SecureDrop. In the past couple of weeks, 
Uh, we also saw Ron Wyden, who's the U.S. Senator from Oregon, urge federal inspectors general to start using SecureDrop for their online tip lines. Uh, these are currently HTTPS sites, which potential whistleblowers can use to submit reports of waste, fraud, and abuse to the government. And in this letter, he's asking for the government to provide uh, stronger technologies like Tor and SecureDrop that also protect whistleblowers' anonymity. So I'm going to stop here, but I do want to say that if you're interested in learning more about this project, uh, please follow us and Freedom of the Press Foundation on Twitter and check out our GitHub and Gitter if you want to get involved. It's been uh, maybe six, almost seven years that the project has been around, and it's uh, now become a critical tool that virtually every major news organization is using every day. We're really lucky to have the team that we do to support all of these organizations. Um, but it is expensive to keep SecureDrop strong each year since it is totally free. And so without support from people like you, this project wouldn't exist. So please support us if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for coming. And totally. uh, <laughs> see you next year. Bye. Bye. <laughs>